Good morning, NDC Oslo. It's nine o'clock in the morning, and we're starting how Sigmund Freud would perform a code review. I'm welcoming you like this, like Robin Williams in the immortal Good Morning Vietnam, because in this situation, I feel a bit like I'm in radio. So I have my headphones on, I have my mic near my head, and well, I see at least some of you people, so I feel like I have an audience. Thank you all for coming, and I hope you're ready for what's coming in, because what we're going to talk today about is a bit of psychology, about how people think of code review, how people think about receiving code review, which is even more important for people who give it. And of course, I'll give you some tips how to give that feedback in a gentle way. So in the end, uh, people will listen gladly what you have to say. So without further ado, my name is Piotr Czajka and I won't attack you with these uh, strange Slavic sounds much more. Uh, I'm coming from the beautiful city of Łódź, which is an industrial city where I'm working for a Dutch company called TomTom. My day-to-day -day life involves creating services and through many services and many teams that I've been, uh, I've gathered some information on what issues we have with code review. And believe me, I've met a lot of great engineers who knew their craft very well, and they knew what they can find in the code, where mistakes can be hidden. But some of them, including, of course, me, uh, lack the way of giving out that information to another person. And that is why I came here to you to change your mind on how to think about code review. Because, you know, giving uh, the, the code review is just half of the work. Uh, the other is knowing how to give it. And, you know, I learned it a bit a hard way because uh, we used to do rough housing in my team at one time. And it was great. We had a lot of fun because we had that game. We tried to find um, more bugs in others' code than they could find in ours. We had laughs, we had fun, and of course it was fun while it lasted. And then one day we failed miserably. And you know, you can ask why, why do we fail? And there is a plethora of ways of failing. One of them, and it's especially problematic nowadays, is being at home office. And that's mostly because not doing review face to face can be a bit problematic because this internet effect tends to kick in. Uh, I'm not saying that everyone turns into an internet troll or hater. No, no, not that. But we tend to be a bit less civilized. Maybe we like, we're not as nice as we should be because we don't see another person. That person is not even in the vicinity. Sometimes we don't even see each other on the webcam because someone has a poor internet connection and we all have to shut them down because we want at least to talk to one another. And some of us sit with their headphones for the whole day. Other teams, they're just meeting on the daily stand-up and they go their own separate ways. And this is the first step to fail uh, because we stop seeing a person on the other side. And it only takes one bad day to reduce the saniest person to lunacy. And so it takes only one bad day to ruin a perfectly working team or a friendship within that team. And as I said, I learned that the hard way. And by that, I mean, we had a team of Java programmers and our manager instantly wasn't a Java programmer, but he was programming in another language in C++. And we had a very exotic for us service, which was written in Python. And at the time I was the only Pythonista in my team. So when everything broke and I had too much work that I really couldn't take the, that one, our manager said that he will take the mantle and he'll fix that for us. We just need to do the code review and fix us. So he did, and I had to do the code review. And from that moment, it all went south because uh, he wasn't really pleased with what I wrote. Uh, he probably felt attacked or threatened that uh, we think less of him because he's not so proficient in writing Python. And he didn't take that well. Uh, he started acting out a bit. 
uh, he forced all code review and all code merges go through him, even though uh, he didn't know the language, but he forced us to do it that way, telling us that, well, this is because we need to have a higher quality of code. But in the end, it just impacted our ability to deliver on time. And of course, in the beginning, I thought that it's entirely his problem. It's entirely his issue because he cannot take criticism well. But then I came to my reason and really there might be some fault of his, but also uh, I had my guard lowered down because we we're having this fun, rough housing. Uh, we were uh, cruel to one another uh, in a joking way. But even if I tried being uh, more serious and uh, nicer, it probably ended rougher than I thought. And it was that moment when I started reading and getting knowledge, how could I perform a code review in a neutral and yet friendly manner so people will get that information, process it, and maybe become better, but at least they won't be angry with me because that's not the case. That's not what we want with code review. And as every great story, this one also starts a long, long time ago in ancient Greece. But I won't really tell much about ancient Greece. This is one of those great bearded philosophers, Plato. And Plato came up with an idea of how we can think of how our mind works. He created what we call nowadays the chariot allegory. And the chariot, the rider, represents our mind, our deliberative mind uh, called logos. And two horses, one is representing emotion, spirit, so, so our high spirit, and the other being our primal desires and appetites. And the idea is that our logical mind has to keep the laces tight so that these two totally different horses won't go their separate ways, but rather uh, let them ride in a straight direction or in the direction that is selected by the mind. It was a good analogy, and it took us over 2,000 of years to come with something that really describes the matter. And the person who did it, and for the matter, received a Nobel Prize for it, is Dr. Daniel Kahneman. Uh, Dr. Kahneman uh, described our mind as a two-part system. First one, often called system one, or fast thinking. Uh, and the second one, system two, slow thinking. We'll dwell a bit on that, because fast thinking is this emotional part, this, this instinct. So basically, those two horses combined. But, and in a way, it is a driving force of our day-to-day -day work, because uh, it helps us go through the everyday. It generalizes, it helps us uh, to answer questions we know by heart, like, what is two plus two? And by generalizing, I mean it helps us uh, do our day-to-day -day mundane work or stuff that uh, we don't really have to think about. Otherwise, we would have to deliberate on every activity of the day that we do. Riding a bike, going by car, even crossing the crosswalk. It, we, we would have to actively think about it. And fast thinking helps us. It also brings stereotypes. Like if we're in a foreign city, we would likely take the route that is well lit with a lot of people rather than a shady alleyway. Because we're thinking that there might be something dangerous there. And this is the good generalization. But of course, as most things have, uh, it also has its dark side. Because from these generalizations, from all these stereotypes, come also harmful stereotypes. It's this system one is responsible for us thinking less of someone because we heard uh, that person saying something that we don't agree with or we deem stupid even. And we extrapolate that on the entire person. Sometimes. We think of a person having just one sample uh, of what they have in mind, what they say. And if you want to know a bit more, I encourage you to, to take a part in this small activity. So a person was described by their neighbor as follows. Steve is a shy and withdrawn, invariably helpful person, but with very little interest in people or the world of reality. A meek and tidy soul, he has a need for order and structure and a passion for detail. Having said that, uh, do you think it is more likely that Steve is a librarian or a farmer? 
think of it for some time, I will tell you about slow thinking and we'll come back to that one after the slow thinking part. So slow thinking is the other part of our brain and our thinking. But in fact, it's not like in the chariot allegory that it governs system one in any way. It's rather a second layer. If system one uh, can't get a comprehensive answer, it will revert to system two. So system two responds for hard questions like what is 173 times 297? Or uh, it gives us more information if you want to deliberate on that person that we uh, were so jud judgmental of. And, but we try to, to genuinely uh, check what that person has in mind. So it helps us to read the reality as it is rather than how we model it in our mind. But of course, there is a pitfall because those systems aren't separated. And it happens even quite often that system one uses system two uh, because it wants just to justify the generalization. And this is where a lot of prejudice, prejudice comes into play. So we have to you know, do this recursive slow thinking. And it's not easy. That's why a lot of people uh, don't put a lot of thought into day-to-day -day work, day-to-day -day thinking, because it, it is quite lazy. And I mean, slow thinking is a, a lazy mechanism that take a lot of energy uh, that our body doesn't want to spare. So this is the uh, dichotomy that really governs our day-to-day -day thinking. But coming back to Steve, all those of you who thought that, well, Steve is obviously a librarian, that's your system one talking, because Steve is basically a most generic librarian, the description of a librarian that you can ever find. It's especially written that way. And all of you who thought oh, there might be a pitfall, he's trying to fool us, or you just uh, genuinely thought that, well, there are statistics that say otherwise, that's system two talking. Because that's true, uh, in America, uh, in where the book was written, farmers uh, are five times uh, more uh, than the librarians. And if you take into consideration that uh, Steve is male, then this ratio is even higher. It's about 20 farmers to one librarian. So it's more likely that Steve is a farmer, but nevertheless, uh, it doesn't have to be so. What more? So these systems also work because we, as people, need to feel in control. We do it by various means. So this generalization helps us get the control because we feel that we understand the world around us. But that's not everything. Uh, also, panic buying. So you probably saw that in your countries. In Poland, people started buying toilet paper. And I mean, you know, tons and tons of toilet paper. Uh, when I saw people running with a full shopping cart of toilet paper, the amount which would suffice for a four-person family for a year or so, I thought that, yeah, you need to go to a doctor, but not for the COVID-19 test, because it, it was a huge amount. But this, this hoarding, this panic buying, really helps us to, to comprehend, to, to fight the anxiety that we have, uh, us thinking we have no control. And if I say, you're bad at code review, some of you may shrug, you may feel bad, and well, that's okay, because that's cognitive dissonance for you. As cognitive dissonance is a kind of stress that's uh, uh, created in your mind where the model you have of the world, of yourself, of uh, things that you think generally is challenged or doesn't match uh, what you get from your eyes and ears, what you read and hear. Uh, basically, it's a dissonance between what you think and what appears to be. And the first person who ever described uh, the way our mind copes with this cognitive dissonance was our today's hero, Sigmund Freud. Of course, I bet you know him from a lot of memes and him being obsessed with sex. But truth be told, he had a lot of great findings other than this. And one of them is personality defense mechanisms. Those mechanisms are hardwired into our mind. They are 
if I remember correctly, over 30 of them. And they help us cope with the world. This world is a harsh and quite unfriendly environment, if you think of it. They work uh, as a driver for a computer. So our mind uh, connects with the world through those uh, nifty uh, personality defense mechanisms. So they filter out a lot of stuff we don't want or that would create an anxiety attack in our brain. Uh, and they work the same way as our software connects with how hardware to the driver. To, to give you an idea uh, what they prevent us from, uh, we don't think about dying every single second of our life. We know that we're mortal, but at the same time, thanks to uh, personality defense mechanisms, we're not thinking constantly of that. When we start thinking of that, we might feel anxiety, but after a while, an hour, a day or so, we will forget it. And if you think that maybe life would be closer to true and a bit better if we don't have this, this filter that just puts rose glasses on our heads and pretend that a lot of stuff doesn't exist, mm, that's not really true. Because people who don't have part of all of the personality defense mechanism often suffer depression, which, as we all know, is a very mm, bad way of, of spending your life. You Basically, you're not spending your life well at all, and you feel miserable. So I would say no to that. There is one more person you need to know before we go to personality defense mechanisms and how they impact the way we uh, interact with uh, mm, uh, with code review. And this is George Eamon Valiant. Uh, George Eamon Valiant took all those personality defense mechanisms that were up to date uh, discovered and divided them into four levels, starting with level one being the easiest way of, of dealing with uh, uh, all, all this, this uh, uh, dissonance and level, level four being the best one that really copes with the issue and helps us grow, not just discard whatever we hear. And talking about discarding, first level is called pathological. And luckily, there is only one uh, defense mechanism that impacts the way we do code review, and it's denial. So basically, that's what I said, we're dropping out the information because pathological level is the level in which People just don't take criticism. They, they discard whatever information they have. They take by heart that their model in their mind is true and the best one they can have. So they don't take criticism very well. And you probably know that kind of people because mm, I guess everyone had that friend that you were doing a code review for. They even agreed that, yes, this is the better way. But in a week, you see, that person doing the same mistake again, and then again, and again. I wouldn't say it's their fault. I wouldn't say they're doing this to angry, uh, to get you angry. Uh, I think that they just cannot cope with that issue that they are wrong, or they think that you think less, you would think lesser of them. So they just discard that thought. And in denial, people who are in denial tend to forget stuff because their defense mechanisms just erase that from their mind. It's not the, this is not a place we want to put uh, a person we're giving review to. So let's take a, take a step further, immature. Immature is a level in which people start to cope with this issue. But in fact, they cope with that issue, but on your expense. And by on your expense, I mean, they will do strange stuff. It may start with projection. So I'll, I'll come back to my story of downfall. And I think that my manager at the time, he did that projection onto us because he had that mental straw man that we are thinking that he's a bad programmer. And he had a, well, rather good view of himself, of himself greatly. And he's a good programmer. So his model, his mind model was okay. But then, instead of uh, judging this, this strawman and his internal model, he just thought, oh, no, uh, this, well, it's not a conscious thought, of course. It's something that we do unconsciously. Uh, he just projected this, I'm a bad programmer, 
to my team. And he, then his mind thought, they're bad programmers. They're just trying to play on you. They're just trying to blame it onto you. And then well, he started acting out. And acting out means the person will try to uh, make the world see the person as a victim and the others as oppressors. And you can see where it's going. It's going to erode the team very quickly. And the last part, passive aggressiveness, uh, I would label it with this uh, uh, forcing everyone to go through, to put the review through him. Uh, passive aggressiveness is, is doing uh, seemingly mundane every everyday activities, but that impact uh, another person or a group of people in a harmful way. In that matter, it impacted our velocity, so we weren't so reliable uh, to the outside world. So you see that level two is also out of question because it can easily uh, go very bad and destroy our team. So level three, neurotic. And in level three, people still try to cope with the issue, but also they're doing it on their own expense. So it's a bit better. It doesn't go anywhere out, but not really. Because repression, so repressing means that people will try to get all those negative emotion and keep them inside of them. And it, this tension will build up. And it may end in one of two ways. First, there will be an outburst. And it can be caused by literally anything, even a uh, snake in your shoe or anything, really. And the other way is being their mind being eroded and they will just get depressed, uh, which is also not a place we want to put our colleagues, right? Intellectualization is a lot less damaging because it's just making excuses. So these people don't fix their behavior, they're just trying to make excuses why they wrote bad code. Maybe because someone wanted something from them and they were distracted, maybe something else, but they still won't fix. They will just find a way to, to justify what they did. The place we want them to be is level four, mature. So as a team, we can anticipate that something may come out of code review, that if I put my code for others to, to judge, there might be some issues, lesser or, or greater, but still it might happen. And it's good to create that kind of uh, feeling in the team that it is not really scary right uh you can deal with it with humor but at the same time if you're dealing with with this stuff with humor uh you must remember that as we did our rough housing it didn't end so well because instead of, of the, it works working great in a team but if we started doing code reviews for other people we had this bar lowered so much that we stopped caring about about others they weren't playing the same game we did and we forget about this the best part i think that that we can we can be in is sublimation because this is the place where i guess we all want to be where this negative energy that comes uh from cognitive dissonance is translated into something productive so we start to learn we start to research we try to change our behavior so we don't make that mistake ever again and what I'll try to, to give you these tips is how to how to get there, how to how to help other people sublimate this issue and become better programmers. And well, basically then we all become better because we're part of one team. So how do we do it? How to do it indeed? Let's start with something fairly simple. Uh, I'd suggest avoiding using the word you. Because you is a, a strange thing. I guess almost every language has an equivalent of that. The, the name, so the known that we call another person uh, that is in front of us that we're uh, talking to directly. And at the same time, if it's neutral, it's okay. But if it has even a slight emotional uh, emotion attached to it, then it, uh, it can go bad because you, is a bit like pointing finger at someone. And nobody likes being pointed finger at. Uh, I hope that I'm not pointing too much on you now, but just think of that. You don't like that, I don't do either. And if you were saying you, you, you all the time, uh, this, this uh, 
you know, emotional block start, starts to come, come up. Yeah. And if you want to, 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 to have an example, then uh, you can think of, of people that you're giving compliments to. If you, if you give a one, two compliments, it's okay. But when you start saying, oh, you're so nice, you're so great, you are so beautiful, you're so talented, I love the way you walk, I love the way you speak, and they start hearing you, 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 and it starts becoming suspicious. They start to, to, to think, oh, there's something that, okay, uh, he wants something from me, or did I do something wrong? Is he preparing me for a bad information? And the same thing comes in code review. If you use a lot of, of the word you, then people feel threatened. I suggest you just say we, and instead of saying you made a mistake, you write, we tend to write code in such and such manner, or we all agreed that naming convention looks like so. That way, you achieve two things. First, out with the threatening word. But second thing, you blur a bit this responsibility. People feel that you're talking as, as a team, and they also, if they feel a part of this team, they also feel that this is them talking. So we go around this, this defense mechanism that block you from, from being uh, properly processed, and it becomes uh, quite natural. Yes, of course, we, we agreed to that. So I'm going to fix it. This way, it's just easier to digest. And you don't lose anything. I, I guess it even sounds better if we say we agreed to something than just pinpointing with your finger that this is bad. The second one, uh, it's a start of a huge group. It's appealing to authority. And don't get me wrong, if you're appealing to Bien Strauss troop or uh, Uncle Bob, it's perfectly OK. But some people tend to appeal to their own authority, which doesn't sound that good from that moment, because if you're giving code review to a junior programmer or just to someone who doesn't have enough, uh, that much uh, experience that you have, well, they might feel threatened from the start. And then you're just building this distance between you even more. And there is more where this came from, because apparently this nice fellow Arthur Schopenhauer, you may know him as a very gloomy man who thought uh, it's very dark about humanity. Uh, and this, by the way, is uh, a picture I found on the internet that he's at least slightly smiling. It's, it's very hard to find the, su such beauty. So, but I am blame him that he has this dark humor because he was born in Danzig, in Gdańsk, basically. Now it's Poland, so he had to be infected by the way Poles see the world, and it's in the shades of gray, basically. <laughs> but there, as I said, there is more where it came from because Arthur Schopenhauer wrote a book called The Art of Being Right, where he described dirty heuristic strategies that help you win the argument. And among them, there are such arguments like argumentum from silence. So it means no one has ever reason uh, any other mm, mm, uh, other options. So that has to be the best one. Or argumentum at populum. Everyone does it like this. So why why not? Or most people, that this is even worse. If you say most people do it like this, it's really hard to, 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 to discuss uh, if you don't have statistics. And even then, it's, it's still hard to, to, to win this argument. Basically, yeah, you, you will win with that statement. If you, if you use any of those dirty heuristic strategies, you will win. Because obviously, for, for the outside world, you're the winner. But at the same time, as I said, it's the art of being right, but it's the art of, being, of winning the argument rather than the, actually giving someone a, a good advice. So you, you become, it feels like you're a bit aggressive when you're using these strategies and you antagonize another person. So even if you reach your goal, in the end, next time, during the code review, you start from the worst position altogether. And well, of being similar to that, there is also something called NLP. And I don't mean natural language processing, which you might be familiar with, but neuro linguistic programming. And if you're not familiar with the second term, then it's basically a, a gathering of methods, ways of speaking, ways of moving and interacting with other people. So they do. Uh, what we want them to do. So 
it's a nifty tricks of mind controlling and i don't really like that but at my time i was quite eager uh, to to try that on my colleagues which i'm today to this day very sorry because it really works it works like a charm uh, at the beginning but then people tend to notice you're talking with them every day you're interacting with them every day and they will see that your attitude has changed and it's a bit artificial so they will know so after initial success you will get a huge downfall and of course once again uh, it will be something that in the end may or may not uh, destroy your team we don't want that now this is something i'm i don't have strong feelings to but i think it's good to be noted you should be skeptic to cargo code and magpie programming so if you're not familiar with the term cargo code comes from cargo cults which uh, were created well they just sprung out uh, after world war ii because when there was a war on the pacific uh, usa and great britain uh, started manning those small islands with indigenous people on them on the pacific building landing strips and, and stuff and because they didn't want to you know start a small uh, war with those people they just brought them gifts but after they were start, uh, stopped uh, they just came back to to their homeland and they left those people without uh, this exotic food they got used to without uh, clothing they were getting from from the outsiders and because they were never introduced what planes really are and how it all works they were never taught anything by by, by those foreigners they thought that if they built a, a kind of, of uh, straw uh, aeroplane the, the other one will come and after several decades it just became a kind of cult and the same goes with programming we see that people do similar stuff again and again uh, and we take it for granted. We do it because it has been done forever and ever. And Magpie programming, well, I'm a Magpie programmer. I love all those new shiny uh, languages, new shiny libraries. It's, it's so cool. But it's also very irritating to people you're going to, to put this, this Magpie programming code review. I was trying to you know, put every new stuff I found out to the code review and say, you know, this is better. And I guess it was infuriating for my colleagues when Java 8 came and uh, they introduced functional programming. And I wanted to change every for loop for, for a stream. And of course, people started telling me that, you know, uh, it's, it, it's not as fast as it should be. And they had to, to give all those arguments. Mm. And what I'm really trying to say in being skeptic to cargo code and Magpie programming I basically encourage you to be skeptic about your thinking because there is nothing inherently bad in magpie programming also with cargo code programming but you should be skeptic about uh, the way you think about the mm, code review they're going to give about is it really an issue that you're trying to resolve or is it just a thing that i want this code to look different so be skeptic more to yourself than just to those types of programming. And last thing that is, uh, that is a don't. So I guess there's a lot of don'ts here. I guess that's because I'm from Poland, so um, it's grim and dark. <laughs> but seriously, uh, don't criticize for the sake of criticism. And you know, sometimes we just have that bad day. The other people that uh, put their code to review can have a bad day, and you can have a bad day too. And even if you're very conscious, it might just spill onto your code review. No one's asking you uh, what happened, but uh, you might be a bit harsher than usual. You might be less nice. Maybe it's best just not to do this code review that day. If it can wait, leave it for another day. Maybe you'll have a, a better humor that time. Or you may have a better humor even a few hours later. So just wait for it the other part of criticizing for the sake of criticism is the true fault finding so sometimes there is stuff in the code that irritates us and it's not a part of our code style it's not a part of naming convention but somehow we see that different people do it differently and it is just not right some of us well i was one of those people try to, to write this down in the code review 
that maybe we should change it, it will be more consistent and so on. But really, we're talking with one person there. If you want to change something in our code review, uh, in, in our code style or, or naming convention, let's take it to the coffee break with the team or just make a meeting and talk about it that you want to change this. And I would say it's a win-win situation because either way, you will either get what you wanted from the beginning, so you will get uh, it to be changed to what you wanted, or there will be, because there is uh, the, the, this, this differentiation between how people write code. So you will find uh, some way to unify that. That might not be your way, but from that moment, you will know that this is the way you're taking. So it's a smaller win, but still. And now for the nice part. So I encourage you to do uh, show and tell in your code review. And if you're a bit familiar with uh, screenwriting, you know that they say show don't tell uh, because it, it's, it's called exposition and it's basically uh, we have great actors. So if they're coming in and saying, oh, I came into the room, it doesn't serve any purpose. But in code review, it's an entirely different story. Show and tell is great because you help people understand what you have in mind while doing code review. Instead of writing, oh, there is an error there, you can describe what kind of an error there is and give an example how you would fix that. It's also a nice sanitization of your idea. If you can put it down as a snippet of code or at least a link to a page that described uh, a more complex uh, uh, thing, then you will have the sanitization uh, that, that is so needed in code review. I, I had, uh, an, well, this kind of thing in my team recently. So one of my colleagues did a review of a code of another. And he wrote him, I would say, that the simplest and maybe not the worst, but uh, not so nice uh, review. He said, this name uh, is wrong, fix it, full stop. Basically, well, it, it, it says nothing. And <laughs> the, uh, the owner of the code, he was, he was so afraid to ask him. He somehow felt threatened that he thought that maybe he, he's angry with him because he didn't comply to some rules he didn't know. So instead of asking the reviewer, he asked me, how should he fix the code? And well, basically those names were okay. So I said, you know, those names are okay. And if you want to know, uh, just ask him, ask him what he would suggest you name, rename those, those variables. So he did and received the answer. But think of it, if from the start, my colleague would write, uh, this is according to our code style, but yet it's not explicit enough. I would suggest you name them like this and that. All this situation, this, this additional stress and additional uh, talks that took time of, of another programmer, they wouldn't just be there. And everything would be clear. And maybe it would be a nice opening for a conversation about our code style, our, our naming convention. And if I'm telling about conversation, this is also crucial. Think of code review as a start of conversation because somehow review is a trigger word. Because we think of review as a book review, a movie review, but at the same time, think that movie review or book review, they, they are written after the book is published, after the movie is in the theater. So what can this reviewer do? They can just write, oh, you have to see it, you have to read it because it's great, or just don't buy it. Uh, it's a waste of your time and money. That's all. The point where we're, try we're doing review is what in the book process is the editorial part and uh, you know, fix fixing mistakes in your book. And there is a lot of back and forth conversation. People not only ask you, uh, not, not only ask questions that, oh, I think this is an error, and the author can write, no, it's not an error, but they also are inquisitive and curious about this book because they ask questions like, oh, I, I'm not sure if you meant that or that, but if, if it's the second option, then maybe you should consider something else. And this way of doing code review not only helps you as the reviewer to get the code more, if you're to, to know the code more, because you're inquisitive, you're, you're curious, you should be curious about the code you're reviewing. It also uh, creates this connection between you and the person who wrote the code. 
that you're not just the fault finding person, the one who pinpoints the issues. You're the one who truly cares about the code. And it's easier to, to talk with such person because it is less threatening. At least this is how our mind judges it. So if you think of hmm, code review as, as code uh, editorial, then it's a bit easier to, 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 to fight the, those na nasty habits that, that we tend to have. Uh, the last nice thing would be saying something nice for a change. And basically saying something nice is, uh, well, it's not a must. I'm not encouraging you to force, forcefully finding something that, oh, I, I must say something nice, so I I'll do it dishonestly. No, be honest. If you like something in the code, it's good to say that. If it's interesting, you can ask for a link or, or uh, for a definition or whatever. Uh, just, it helps you to create this flow, the same flow as you have previously with the uh, conversation part. But you, you become less threatening because you're interested in the code. And it's just our brains. We cannot help it. There is this, this primal part in us that if we feel threatened from the start, then it's harder to gain that, that trust. But if we say something nice, if we start on the, on the good foot, on the, on, on the good note, then it's easier. That's why, why not? It doesn't cost. Being nice costs nothing, really. And it can change a lot in the relationships you have. So I guess this is, this is basically at least some of the methods that Sigmund Freud could use to perform a code review. Uh, I encourage you to, to, to think of the code review as a shared responsibility and start a conversation and, and just say nice things to another person, not just default finding and uh, pointing out that it is somebody's fault. Well, if code is shared responsibility, it's our own. It's, it's not anybody's fault that there is a mistake. It's a fault if these mistakes go through the code, code review and they are not found, then it, it's really somebody's fault. And please don't use NLP and dirty heuristic strategies because, well, that's, that's just unnice and uh, pure dirty, just like uh, just say Arthur Schopenhauer said. So just to wrap stuff up, uh, I think you should be honest with your code review. Be honest with another person of what you think about the code, but also be honest with yourself and be critical for the, the sake of things. Be open because sometimes you can find something new in the code that you never encountered before, and it doesn't have to be wrong. And be mindful, because on the other side of that code, there is a person that also has emotions and basically ha can have a bad day as well as we do. So if you see a person on the other side of the code, it will all be okay. Just remember, a spoonful of sugar helps the medicine go down. And well, in a way, code review is a medicine. If you want to read something about this psychology part that, uh, that I've just briefly run through the first part of presentation, uh, there is a book from Arthur Schopenhauer that I mentioned, The Art of Being Right, which is not so easy to read, but basically describes all, it's about 20 dirt heuristic strategies that you even unconsciously may uh, just use in your everyday life. And you may, you, then you will know why not to use them so often. If you want to know more about uh, self-defense mechanisms, you can start with Phoebe Kramer because it's a very nice book, Protecting the Self, that just encapsulates all the necessary information. But of course, the original is always best. So if ever, you can check Sigmund Freud's uh, The Ego and the Mechanisms of Defense that was later edited by his daughter, Anna, and uh, a paper from Dr. George Eman Valiant about uh, the hierarchy of defense mechanisms. And of course, last but not least, it, it's a person who received a Nobel Prize, uh, Thinking Fast and Slow, by Dr. Daniel Kahneman. It's, well, it's a huge book, but also it's, uh, it tells a lot more. It doesn't only relate to our day-to-day -day, uh, thinking or mm, meeting with other people. It really opens your mind to seeing why do we think stuff we think, and why sometimes we, we are surprised by the way we think. It's a huge, huge book that really encapsulates a lot of pitfalls 
that we can we can um, fall in while just um, you know just living basically so i will put down this uh, presentation into our slack channel but also if you would like it will be on the slide deck shared on my twitter account so uh, you don't you don't have to write anything down and this is i'm sorry this is the end but i'm open for questioning now thank you very much <laughs> um i have a question yeah, sure hi um don't you think this is your talk is not only about giving uh reviews giving feedback on the code but also receiving feedback from the code uh, well yes it there is there is a lot of stuff here that's also on the receiving end. Uh, I, truth be told, I was trying to, to maybe get rid of, of those parts, but at the same time, we are reviewers and the people who receive the review. So in the end, I let them sit because it's, it's also a bit easier to, if you're a reviewer, even if you're just reviewing the code, it's easier to see the other, if you know what techniques the other side can can implement. Uh, you can suggest them. You know, you can you can help them develop them. So I think it's also good if you're not you you're not ever writing code, but just reviewing it to to, to also know this part. Did that, did that uh, answer your question? Yeah, I'm I'm a bit concerned because in my practice, if if reviewer and the reviewee, let's call it like this, are not aren't on the same page, like. Um, being, for example, like in phase four, you described, uh, like for example, you want them to be in phase four. You want to discuss uh, sort of code detached from a person, um, accept the feedback with, 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 be grateful for the feedback because basically it's the use of time of another person who is in the review and not react in anger. And if, if a review is not on the same page with the reviewer in terms of how to accept the feedback, it gets really hard. So I, I, I'm a bit like this is for me, it's a still unsolved questions because imagine I read all these books and I have Kahneman book on my shelf. Um, but the other person spends no time developing themselves in, in that kind of area and trying to understand the psychology of other team members. And they just close themselves in the box and being very kind of um, defensive against their code. It becomes extremely hard to give any review. And some people just get reluctant from even reviewing the code of such a person. So I'm wondering if there is any way to open these boxes. Uh, okay, so uh, I have, well, uh, I have my own experience on that. So this talk is. Uh... Uh, a kind of, of baby of two years of practicing that stuff on my team, <laughs> basically. And uh, because after after that incident uh, I, I described, my team just broke up because this, 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 I don't think that this is the only reason, but this was the last drop that, that destroyed the team, the bad code review that was unfortunately my fault. And so that's why I also started well, changing my ways. And when we found a new team with, with other people, uh, I started implying, well, one by one, the, those uh, those tricks and tips that I've, I was giving here, uh, and none of, of my colleagues read the Kahneman book, and none of them also read the the other ones. That for that I'm certain, but they see uh, they, they they see that if you're giving the code review in such manner, it starts to to you know slowly get to them. I'm saying that this will help everyone at every time but it really it really starts to grow into them and the, they feel that another way of approaching the code review seems better of course uh, there might be so as i as i also said that last month or so it happened that uh, one of the colleagues just wrote it's bad but it was the first time i've saw that type of comment for a year or something so uh, it's it's not an instant win Whatever you do, it's day-to-day -day work with other people. You talk with them about code review also, uh, and it just happens. It's 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 a process, not a uh, not a magic trick. I'm um, I'm afraid. But this is something I really uh, worked on with my team without telling them this. 
They they just learned about this recently when I started writing this book. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll just look quickly to the uh, to the chat window. Are there any any other questions? Anyone? Yeah, I can talk with you forever about this. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> I just don't know how much time we have. Uh, I I had this idea of. Um, uh, what I struggle with code reviews sometimes is that uh, when I when I uh, been asked uh, when I'm asked to review the code and I'm get to the to the code itself. Let's say we have a pull request and I need to through, through look through all the changes. And in in my view, uh, my struggle always is is that if I'm not actively involved in that part of the system development, for example, I have no idea what's going on. So it's easier to get the sort of technical code review in terms of patterns and coding styles, naming conventions, and stuff like that. But it's really, it's much harder to give review on a functional side because they basically don't know that domain, for example. So yeah. I try to encourage developers to, before they start writing codes, like they have an issue, right? So Jinjira or GitHub or GitLab, whatever, uh, actually try what they're gonna do and maybe ask a colleague to do the review upfront in terms of the implementation plans. Have we ever used that kind of thing? Do you think it would help? I, I think that might help. I've never tried that one. Uh, I tried that another approach. So it was an approach uh, uh, that, that's applied on the end. So when they already did everything and then they're putting uh, code on the review, the first round of review, so it's a, a two-step review. First round of review it is a person and a reviewee uh, telling uh, about the code. So what is its purpose? Uh, about se selected mechanisms and so on with the code to the w one of the reviewers that it or to everyone if, if the team has time but from my experience it's more like one person can can hear all of this and be let's say the main reviewer who, who has the whole knowledge and the others just do this technical part so uh, the colleague describes it the, he tells about the code is like, you know it's like a proofreading like you do with a, a red from ikea or something <laughs> or, or the rubber ducky but with a real person so so the reviewer can ask questions can you know this this inquisitive stuff right and then uh, with that knowledge they have uh, what is the purpose uh, why those mechanisms and not others are selected and probably with uh, some some issues pinpointed at that moment that person goes uh, into, let's say, Bitbucket or GitHub code review, the technical part, and just uh, finishes off uh, with this. Hmm. So this is something- Their programming would actually remove the need for that. It's like, um, so it will be done seamlessly when writing code, and maybe it will say, save hell a lot of time. Oh, yes. uh, uh, we did feel pair programming in, I guess it was my first job, uh, it was working like a charm, but at the same time, not every product owner is very open for that kind of uh, of working. Uh, it's hard to to give them uh, good reasoning, and even if they hear good reasoning, sometimes it's uh, you know against the the way. So th this is this uh, uh, cargo code, but from the management side. So now we have always coded only one person, one code, right? And it's it's hard to to discuss with that, really, but. Uh, I think when we were doing the, the per programming part, it was it was very uh, productive, and I guess mm, it was easier to to pinpoint issues before them even appearing. There's a question in the chat. Yeah. Okay. So, what is the context uh, you're doing review? Is it diff per commit while subsystem per bigger release? So. Uh, it's mixed uh, in ours, uh, it, at least in my team. We sometimes we do this this small commit changes because it's easier. Just I, I like this part more because um, if if you're constantly developing, so it's it's best if you're developing with, with the team and you're working on the similar if not the same modules, then you get you get that feeling. It's it's easier because you know what's happening and this uh, you don't have to put so much time into reviewing. Because this is uh, these are small chunks of code that that you're that you're fixing, uh, but we also did this this bigger so release part uh, 
we sometimes do it even after everything is, is reviewed in the small chunks. So we do the second round before releasing to you know, look at the whole picture, if it really plays well together. Mm, but we were doing also this, this bigger chunks, mostly when several people were working on the same module. So we wanted to see if, uh, if they match correctly and, and stuff. So mm, it's not the way I prefer because then it takes a lot of time for the reviewer to review stuff. Mm, and you get bored. You, get, you basically uh, lose focus. If it's a small chunk, you're more focused and, and more eager to, to, to find bugs. If it's, if it's too long, then uh, it just starts to, 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 to be a cumbersome job. Uh, I, I, I'm looking at Slack again. Uh, no, no, no other questions, I guess. Um, so I can, you know, uh, you, you can talk to me <laughs> if, if you like now, or we can, we can meet on Slack uh, afterwards. But, but basically, thank you. Thank you for, for coming. Thank you for questions and insights. Because of course, this, this presentation is going to, to be uh, uh, getting better with all the feedback I get from you. Great talk, thank you. Is, uh, got the, uh, black oh. Uh, oh. On the bottom. Okay, I'm looking. Uh, as, uh, in a distributed system where different teams are responsible for different areas, where they should, in theory, the, be autonomous to deliver the code, how do you encourage these general best practices about reviewing so that people don't feel this is mine. Why are you looking here? Uh, well, uh, I'm trying. So I'm trying to do this by, this by example. So this is at least my approach from the beginning with with my current team. Uh, I was trying to show them that if they have some harsh words for me, uh, uh, even if the, if I didn't feel comfortable with with this review, I always tried to take it with a smile. Uh, and say, okay, so the, thanks for the review. Yeah, I didn't see that. It's, it really needs a fix. Sometimes I started conversation saying, you know, guys, but I wanted to do that and that. Uh, I'm not sure if your idea of, of the fix really works with that, but I'll look into that. Maybe you can look into that and we'll find some, uh, some solution that really fits here best. Mm. Sometimes I talk with, with the guys. So, um, I have two very young programmers in my team. Uh, and uh, it's, of course, a lot easier if you, have, if you have younger, less experienced people because they look up to you. Even if you're not trying to be a kind of father figure or whatever, if you have more experience, it's natural. When I was uh, starting my job, I also was looking up to the uh, friends who, who, who were working for five, four years uh, more than I did. So I think the best way is by example, we have a great scrum master. Uh, so it, we have this natural discussions with him and with the team uh, about, about doing code review, but also about the mm, books like uh, Daniel Kahneman's book. Uh, it was my scrum master who told us about system one and system two and encouraged us to read this book. And even though, uh, you know, the others didn't read uh, the, the book, but I, I did the, the, the whole reading, but he just shown some pitfalls that, that you may you may fall in. And you can do this, you know, little presentations if you like. Uh, I think it works better if you're a scrum master to do that, because uh, I don't know how it looks in your teams. I, I guess every team is special in a way, and they're different. So I, I was in a team, ones that, that didn't look so kindly on the less technical talks. So say they would probably uh, don't look kindly on me giving that kind of talk. But at the same time, now we have, as I said, a great Scrum Master who encourages us to uh, develop in this uh, soft skill areas. Uh, so it also sublimates into guys. And even though uh, they may say otherwise, uh, it just grows into you. Uh, I'll just check if, if I addressed everything. Uh, uh, I have one thing to say, if you don't mind. If we're yes. not run out, yeah. Run out um, time, please. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
I, I, did you read the um, Weinberg's book, Secret of Consulting? Uh, Jerry no. Weinberg. No, oh, this, okay. Uh, but uh, if you drop this one uh, on, on the Slack for me, I will yeah. oh, well. gladly read that one. Yeah, so basically he formulates in kind of amusing, funny way is some serious laws uh, from his consulting experience. One of the laws is, uh, is basically stating that people don't want to, to, people will never admit that they have a problem. So they would eagerly accept your help but they would never admit that the problem existed in the first place. And I, I see it also applicable to code reviews and how. So um, maybe the code review might be approached in a way that like, it, it's, it's, it's maybe like, it's not NLP, right? So it's just like, you make, you see the idea that you want to push to the person's mind in a way that they think the idea is their own. So I, I see that working, and this is basically what that law states, that um, people don't really like to be helped in a way that you want to push help to them. They want to be probably helped in a way that they never need to admit their mistakes. So have you seen that in practice? Because I've seen it a lot. Uh, yeah, yeah uh, I, I didn't, well, I, I never, I accounted to one other of Zavinsky's laws, but I, I, I never heard about that one. I guess somewhere unconsciously, uh, or maybe from, from some other sources. Yeah, I, I've saw that in practice, that it's easier to ask, well, just to start this conversation about, about the code, if you see something is, is not really right, but don't saying it as it is an error, just ask questions. Uh, as I said, be inquisitive, about uh, be curious about the code. And after some talk, you, you can get uh, this, this, I wouldn't say plea for help, but uh, they will open up. This, I, I, I've saw that one. I give you the link in Slack. So it's a really good book. <laughs> yeah, thanks. I, I, I'm definitely going to read that one. Thanks. Do we have any more time? Or, or I, I guess it's 10, so I think we, we, we should be ending. Uh, Okay, so once again, thank you everyone for coming. Thank you for all the insight and, and the nice talk afterwards. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Piotr.